Ezra chapter 1 and verse 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, of king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is among you of all his people? May his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, to Jerusalem which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. And by the help of the Lord this evening, I want us to continue our theme for this month on the faithfulness of God and speak to you about the God is faithful to his people. If you're standing, you may be seated. Thank you for being engaged in the word of God throughout this season. I know you could be eating uh, Fruit Loops and uh, drinking a shaky while you, uh, shake while you're watching, but I appreciate that the people of God and our church is staying engaged, making our living rooms or wherever we may be a sanctuary and a place where we worship and honor God and where we hear from His Word. So I honor you for that. God is faithful. And as God's people, we are witnesses to His unchanging principles of grace and truth. As God's people, we are the focal point of His promises, and we are the beneficiary of His divine purpose. As God is faithful to His principles, as God is faithful to His promises, and as God is faithful to His purpose, in like manner, God is faithful to His people. The Bible is full of triumphant accounts of God's faithfulness. Pick a testament, pick a book in the Bible, open it up, and you will find living evidence to the faithfulness of God to his people. These stories and accounts include our text this evening in Ezra about the return of the exiled Jews back to Jerusalem. But for us to fully appreciate the miraculous nature and the divine appointment of their return, we need to backtrack about 150 years in time. Having watched Judah tragically cross an irreversible line of God's judgment, the prophet Isaiah seems to shift from confronting sin and pronouncing the doom of judgment to now declaring the uncontestable sovereignty of God and proclaiming prophetic hope to a future generation. Tucked in the middle of these majestic passages in Isaiah 40 to Isaiah 66, these passages of a future revival and of messianic hope, we find this amazing prophecy in Isaiah chapter 44. In verse 26, but I carry out the predictions of my prophets, God declares to his people. By them I say to Jerusalem, people will live here again. And to the towns of Judah, you will be rebuilt. I will restore your ruins. When I speak to the rivers and say, dry up, they will be dry. Now hear this, when I say of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, he will certainly do as I say. He will command, rebuild Jerusalem. He will say, restore the temple. You have to understand Isaiah's audience. They would have been shocked. They would have been frustrated. And they were probably mad at Isaiah's word that God would call Cyrus his shepherd. This was language reserved for David and his descendants. But yet God speaks of a heathen, a pagan, a king, who was not even born yet, and God calls him 
my shepherd, because he's going to rebuild Jerusalem. He's going to restore the temple. In chapter 45 and 1, continuing the message, this is what Isaiah writes. This is what the Lord says to Cyrus. He is anointed one whose right hand he will empower. Before him, mighty kings will be paralyzed with fear. Their fortress gates will be open never to shut again. In verse 13, God says, I will raise up Cyrus to fulfill my righteous purpose. I will guide his actions. He will restore my city and free my captives, my captive people without seeking a reward. I, the Lord of heaven's armies, have spoken. You see, approximately 150 years before Cyrus ever marched into Babylon. In fact, before he was ever born, God called him out by name and God defined the redemptive divine purpose of his reign. His purpose was to release the people of God, to rebuild the city of God and to restore the temple of God. But the backdrop to the return of the exiles that we read about in our text in Ezra 1 doesn't just stop with this powerful prophecy by Isaiah. You see, appropriately called the weeping prophet, Jeremiah had the thankless task of serving a hard-headed and hard-hearted people who were unwilling to repent. Broken-hearted, Jeremiah watched the crushing conquest of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar in 605 BC where Daniel and his three friends were probably exiled to Babylon. Frustrated by Jerusalem's continuing rebellion, Nebuchadnezzar returned in 597 BC, easily squashed the rebellion and deported this time around 10,000 Jews. Yet here, even in exile, even in exile a people who were unrepentant in their hearts, had prophets who would speak to their ears messages that were false and not from God. Even in exile, false prophets continued to spout off revolutionary messages that God was about to deliver his people and restore Jerusalem and defeat Babylon. And so responding to these erroneous declarations, Jeremiah, who had been left behind in Jerusalem, writes these exiles a letter and this is what he says in Jeremiah 29 and 4. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to all the captives he has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. This is what he says. Build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food they produce. Marry and have children. Then sp find spouses for them that you may have many grandchildren. Multiply, do not dwindle away. And work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. In verse 10 Jeremiah continues and says, this is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon 70 years, but then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised. I will bring you home again. For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. Jeremiah's letter was shocking. It was sobering to the exiles. It was not a word that they wanted to hear. God was not coming to their rescue anytime soon. In fact, most of the people who would have been reading this letter would die in Babylon. But in the midst of this deflating declaration, there remained a hope-filled message of redemptive future. God would fulfill his plan. But in the meantime, they would have to submit 
to his plan and they would have to remain in the place of his choosing. It would be God's pace and not their pace that would determine the word of the Lord. And so God said, build, plant, marry, and multiply, and you do it in Babylon. And just to insult their Jewish minds and culture, God said, I want you to seek Babylon's welfare. I don't want you to just pray for Jerusalem. I want you to pray for Babylon and for her peace and for her prosperity. Isaiah spoke and called out Cyrus. Jeremiah spoke and defined a term of 70 years of captivity and Babylonian rule and empire. And it is against this prophetic backdrop that God's divine favor upon Cyrus remarkably unfolds. He rose to power in 559 BC as nothing more than a subordinate king to the Medes. And yet Cyrus somehow quickly managed to gain the loyalty of all the Persian tribes. By 549, he had completely conquered the Median Empire as two successive armies of Medes sent to destroy him somehow decided that they would join him instead of fighting against him. He then conquered all of Armenia without even a fight being put up. He surprisingly defeated the powerful Lydians when their horses were spooked and panicked at the sight of his cavalry of camels. It was then that Cyrus turned his attention to the seemingly invincible Babylonian empire. And yet his armies methodically advanced through the empire and easily defeated every Babylonian army that they faced. Maybe most astonishing of all, when what may have been the most heavily fortified city in the world, Babylon, that icon of an empire. And yet when the forces of, of Cyrus arrived, Babylon opened its gates without a fight as the Mede and Persian armies assumed complete control in one single night. Cyrus' success is a matter of marvel to his contemporary world. We know from the records of that ancient day that he was considered beloved of the gods. But it wasn't the gods with a little g who were behind the marvelous ascent of this world empire. It wasn't Cyrus's sterling character or his brilliant mind. It was not a matter of historical chance. It was the divine orchestration of a God who had called him by name 150 years before he ever rode into Babylon. And it was all for the ultimate purpose of God to fulfill his redemptive promises to his people. We don't know how it happened. We do not know what initiated it. Josephus, the Jewish historian, records that in the first year of his consolidated reign over Babylon, that Cyrus was shown Isaiah's prophecy and was motivated by God to fulfill it. What we do know, though, is found in Ezra chapter 1, that in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord God of heaven has given me. He's commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem which is in Judah, who is among you of all his people. May his God be with him, and may he go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God. Just as Isaiah had foretold it 150 years in advance, just as Jeremiah had prophesied that it would come to pass. And according to the precise timing of God's divine calendar, it was Cyrus who initiated the first wave of 49,897 exiles 
who returned back to Jerusalem with the funding and the materials to begin rebuilding the temple of God. There really is no logical reason why Cyrus would even care about a small minority of Jew refugees who were in his kingdom. There is no logical reason why Cyrus would care about a land whose capital was a wasteland and who posed no threat to his rule. There was no reason that he would facilitate the restoration and the rebuilding of a temple of a God he did not publicly serve. But there was a supernatural reason and it was that God always keeps his word and God is always faithful to his people. That is the account of God's miraculous restoration of the exiles. You can pick a book, you can pick any part of the Bible you want and you will find similar stories of how defying all odds and defying all human logic that God is faithful to his people. World empires, he tears down and he raises up. Leaders, he anoints, he calls, he raises up, he tears down and he does it all for the purpose of being sure and being true to his word and for being faithful to his people. Maybe you're hearing this tonight, but in your mind you're thinking, yeah, that's an inspiring story. That's real cute, but that happened in 538 BC and I live in 2020 AD. What about my loneliness and what about my job? What about God's promises and God's calling in my life? And for that matter, what about this pandemic and what about this crushed economy and what about this crazy election what about the what about the massacre of the unborn and the unrestrained sexual perversion that is celebrated by an entire political party and by many influential segments of our society what is going on in our world what is happening around me when will God's promises ever come to pass in my life how is the church ever going to respond to the chaos of culture Will we ever see that promise influx of unprecedented believers entering into the kingdom of God? And when is he ever coming back? You see, to these questions that may be very real and they may be very pertinent in your mind and there's a thousand more like them. I only offer one simple but all-encompassing answer and it is just this, that God is faithful. He is faithful to his word and he is faithful to his people. And so whatever challenges that we face and whatever obstacles are before us and whatever frustrations we may feel in the present. The reality is that as we run the race of life and as we pursue God's purpose, we are surrounded. We are surrounded by a host of witnesses who are all testifying that God is faithful and God is faithful to his people. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 12 and 1, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. How do we do this? Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so when we are faced in 2020 by a daunting array of questions, when we are challenged in our faith, we simply look to Jesus Christ. It is he alone who is the author and the finisher 
finisher of our faith. It is he that is the navigation through every decision point. It is he that is the wisdom for every question. It is he that is the strength for every trial. I may not have the answer that you want this evening for all the questions that are weighing on your mind, but I have the right answer. And the answer is that God is faithful to his people. He will always keep his word and there is nothing in heaven or earth that can prevent God's redemptive purpose from coming to pass in your life. Paul wrote the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23. Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. God will make this happen for he who calls you is faithful. And Paul wrote to the Thessalonians again in a second letter. And in three and three, he said, but the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. You see from the eight souls on Noah's ark to the Moses' band of two million plus refugees going through the Red Sea, God is faithful to his people. From the deliverance of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, from Nebuchadnezzar's fiery furnace to the deliverance of Esther and the Jewish exiles from Haman's genocide, God is faithful to his people. From Paul and Silas locked in a Philippian prison to Paul kneeling before a demented Caesar's executioner knowing that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. God is faithful to his people. From 120 Jewish believers in an upper room to a multitude of multicultural believers turning the world upside down with the gospel message to an innumerable host of saints from every tongue and tribe worshiping around the eternal throne of God. God is faithful to his people. So hear the word of the Lord for you and I this evening, borrowing Jeremiah's words to the exiles, plant, build, marry, and multiply. Work for the peace and prosperity of our nation and pray. In other words, just keep doing what you've been doing. Just keep doing what the New Testament calls every disciple to do. To watch and pray as Jesus taught throughout his ministry. To be obedient to the word of God. To walk in the spirit. To be faithful to the mission to seek and save the lost. Just keep believing. Just keep trusting. Just keep knowing that God is faithful to his people. Just keep remembering. Just keep rehearsing Brother John's message from this past Sunday as David declared in Psalms 103, the paradigm of, of, of worship and the paradigm really of our relationship with God. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture and it is in that confidence that we, re that we read and remind ourselves again of these powerful words of hope in Psalms 23 that if the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want and so standing upon the word of God I choose faith not fear I choose worship and not worry. I choose consecration and not carnality. I choose sacrifice over selfishness. And I choose the love of God over the lust of the flesh because the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. And so this evening I come with a simple message that God is faithful to his people. So let your life and let your family be anchored in a resolute trust that in God, a confidence that is established in who God is. Let your faith 
be established in God and it will eradicate confusion. It will eradicate depression. It will eradicate fear by the renewing strength of God's spirit and the powerful encouragement and assurance of his word that God is faithful to his people. So standing on the word of God, we build and we plant and we marry and we multiply. We seek the peace and prosperity of our nation and we pray for all people. We just keep being the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ and we may not have it figured out and God may not reveal his calendar and we may not understand his pace and we may wonder how long must we tarry and how long must we occupy? But through it all, this is our confidence that God is faithful to his people. God is faithful to his people. Would you bow your heads and would you join me in prayer right now? Lord, I thank you from your word. God, I could teach from dozens and dozens of other stories. We could explore scripture after scripture this evening, God, until, Lord, we pass out in exhaustion, and yet we would barely scratch the surface of the witness that you are faithful to us as your people. In every generation, there are voices who cry out, God, the same message, that you always keep your word, and we are the apple of your eye, and everything Thing that happens, God, God is done, God, for the fulfillment of your divine purpose. There is no scheme of Satan that you are unaware of. There is no circumstance of life and human existence, God, that can thwart your purpose. You are faithful and you are faithful to your people. I thank you, Lord, that you are for us. I pray for the person that is discouraged. I pray for the believer that is lonely. I pray for the arresting, convicting power of the Holy Ghost for those, Lord God, whose faith has been shaken and they find themselves excusing compromise. I pray in this evening hour that the conviction of your word would call them back and let their faith be established in you this evening, God, that you are faithful and you are faithful to your word and faithful to your people. God, you will never leave us and you will never forsake us. God, we look to you, the author and the finisher of our faith, you're our provider. You are our way maker. You are our healer. You are our peace giver. You are our provider, Lord, of all that we need. Jesus, I pray over your people. I pray over the sheep of your pasture. God, you are our shepherd and we will not want. We anchor ourselves in a resolute trust in you, God. We establish our feet upon the testimony of your true word, God, that you are for us that we are your people and you are faithful to your people Lord I pray this evening God as we gather together here in prayer that you would bless your people and that you would keep them I pray God that your face would continue to shine upon us Lord I ask you to always be gracious to us and I pray that your countenance would be favorable upon us and God I pray for your holy peace and I pray it all in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you lift up your voice and would you set your heart towards the Lord this evening? And would you make your home and wherever you're at a place of prayer? And would you allow the visitation and the witness of the Holy Ghost right now in your heart establish you in the confidence that God is faithful to his people. Let's lift up our voice and continue to pray.